Wow. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, I should first of all say that I bring greetings from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth uh, to her loyal subjects here in the USA. Um, I know we had a little falling out a couple of hundred years ago, but we'll, we'll let bygones be bygones. So it, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, as Michael mentioned, my name is Justin, and I run a faith debate show in the UK. It's one of the UK's only Christian radio stations, Premier Christian Radio. And really, it's a show all about helping Christians have better conversations with their skeptical friends, neighbors, and family. Now, I don't know if you ever get a bit tongue-tied when it comes to having those kinds of conversations. Maybe you've got someone in your life who doesn't believe, maybe is quite anti-God, anti-faith in some ways. Well, in many ways, that situation is true for Christians all over the place, isn't it? Especially in the UK. Just recently, we had a new survey come out. In the UK, it now looks like more people are claiming to be atheist or have no religion than there are who claim to have some kind of Christian faith. And that's been the story for a long time in the UK. And in many ways, I think across the whole of the West, there's been a kind of secularization gradually. Well, I started my show really to have conversations with people who don't believe. I was working at Premier Christian Radio in the UK, and we were doing a great job of talking to Christians about Christian things, resourcing the Christian community in the UK. But I went to the manager of the station and I said, I'd love to have one point in the week, each week, when I can host a conversation with someone who doesn't believe. Because actually, when we're out there, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, those are the people we're sitting next to and sharing life with. And it would be great if we could model how to have good conversations with people who don't share our faith. And that was where my unbelievable show came from. It's unbelievable with a question mark. I think we've got a picture of me in studio hosting a show. And each week, I bring together uh, people who have faith, Christians, and people who don't have faith. They may be an atheist, an agnostic, or they might be someone of another faith, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Jew. And I have these conversations, host them, and we just have a fantastic time learning from each other, engaging in mutual dialogue. And over time, that show has uh, generated quite an audience, not just in the UK, on the radio station where we broadcast, but also all over the world. We started podcasting the show. Believe it or not, there are now more listeners of my show here in America than there are in the UK. So it's been a wonderful journey as we've seen more and more people engage in these conversations. Because very often, I think Christians feel nervous when it comes to having conversations about their faith with people who don't believe. And very often, we just duck it, we shy away if we're not sure what to say or what kind of answer to give. But I think actually simply listening to people having conversations will help us to have better conversations. And we need to relearn the art of having good conversations. Our culture is so polarized these days, isn't it? When it comes to politics or culture or religion, we kind of, we've lost the art of actually getting on, agreeing disagreeably. I mean, I don't know if anyone here is on any Facebook groups or social media where those kinds of conversations happen, but it gets pretty nasty pretty quickly, I think you'd agree. Well, what we've aimed to do on this show is to help to show what a good conversation might look like. Over the years, we've also added in terms of other ways that we bring the show to people. Uh, we've really done a lot of video in the last year and a half or so. There's a picture on screen of uh, a recent dialogue that I uh, hosted between uh, the person on the left of the shot is Hugh Ross. He's an astrophysicist. He's part of an organization called Reasons to Believe. And they're actually based in your own backyard uh, here in uh, Covina area. And uh, he's a wonderful Christian who explains why there's so much evidence for God from science. And he, he in that particular program, was engaging with uh, a well-known atheist in the UK, uh, a, a professor of chemistry at Oxford University, called Peter Atkins, and they had a really interesting engagement together. And as well as doing the show uh, via the podcast, the radio, on the video as well, we're also branching out into conferences as well. We just had, just a week ago in the UK, our annual London conference, where we invite Christian thinkers from all over the world to come and spend a day helping Christians to think through their faith 
and helping them to answer some of the big questions that their friends and neighbors might pose to them. And guess what? We're coming to the USA again in October here in California. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Um, up on the screens, you can see some of the details there. It's going to be the 11th and 12th of October at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Uh, if you want to, to, to come along, we'd love to see you there. The Friday evening is actually going to be a live edition of my show. Uh, we're going to be having a Christian join me on the stage. Um, he's a guy called Professor John Lennox. He's a wonderful Christian thinker from the UK. He's an Oxford professor of mathematics and the philosophy of science. And he's going to be engaging with a local celebrity, really, a guy called Dave Rubin, who runs the Rubin Report. Uh, and it broadcasts uh, all over the place. It's got a huge following online. Uh, and Dave Rubin is a secular Jew. And they're going to be discussing God, faith, and atheism. So come out on the Friday, the 11th of October, to see that fantastic live show. Uh, and then stay on for Saturday the 12th. We're going to be having a conference where we'll have some wonderful speakers from both the UK and USA helping us as Christians to put our faith together and how to have those confident conversations. So it's been an exciting journey uh, on the show. Uh, it's been an amazing opportunity and a, and a wonderful privilege to be able to host these conversations, not just because of the people I get to sit down with, but also because increasingly, as we've put the show out on podcast, I've suddenly found all kinds of atheists and agnostics and non-believers also tuning into the show. People who say to me, you would never catch me listening to Christian radio, but your show is the exception. And I think it's because we've provided this neutral ground, this place where we can have these conversations, where people feel like their ideas and their thinking are being taken seriously. And if there's one verse that really embodies the ethos of the show, it would be this one, 1 Peter 3.15. It says there, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to give people reasons for the hope that we have. We're saying you, to be a Christian doesn't mean that you check your brain at the door when you come to church. No, being a Christian means that you put your mind to good use. We're, we're encouraged to uh, worship the God, love the Lord our God with all our heart, strength, soul, and our mind. We're not supposed to separate the two. And so that's what it's all about on the show, having that mutual dialogue where we, we understand that we're not going to agree, and there's going to be tough questions, and we're not claiming we have all the answers, but we are saying we think there's something about this Christian story that is extraordinary, that is compelling, and we want to let you know why we're Christians. So that's what I've been aiming to do over the last 12 or 13 years. And the show has really grown up in the shadow of a particularly aggressive kind of atheism that took root about 10 or 12 years ago. Sometimes it's called the new atheism. I don't know if anyone's heard of that term, the new atheism. But really, the figurehead at the front of that is a guy called Richard Dawkins. He's a biology professor in uh, Oxford, and uh, he wrote a book about 10 years ago called The God Delusion. And it was basically a book that said, religion, it's all just fairy tales. You know, anyone who believes in God is basically just delusional. And so that's been the sort of narrative that we've seen in our culture. In the West, many people buying into this view that God is just for people who've left their brain at the door. And so what we've been aiming to do on the show is to show a different story, a different kind of narrative, that actually you can be a Christian who uses your brain, who loves science, who loves history, who loves culture, and you can believe that at the center of all of that is a person called Jesus Christ. And so it's with Richard Dawkins in mind and the fact that he's, if you like, put the questions to us as Christians that we've had to then step up and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to answer this? What are we going to do for this next generation who are watching people like Richard Dawkins online? Where are the Christian thinkers who are going to step forward and give the, the account for God, make a defense of the faith? That's uh, sometimes what you, we think of when we talk about apologetics. So it's, it's a strange kind of word because it sounds like you're apologizing for something, but actually it, it comes from the Greek word apologia, which is to make a defense of a viewpoint. It's a legal term. And very often what we're doing when we're speaking to skeptics is we're making a defense of our faith. We're showing them why we believe what we believe. 
And over the years, it struck me that sometimes many Christians feel like all of the onus is on them, that they have to bear the burden of all the proof and all the evidence. You know, the atheist may be over here saying, well, look, I don't believe in God, so could you show me some evidence, please? And maybe the Christian is here scratching their head and thinking, well, ah, oh, gee, that's, that's going to be tough. Um, but actually, I don't think it's like that. I think actually everyone has a point of view. Everyone has what you might call a worldview. Now, for the Christian over here, it's going to be that they believe there's a God who created the universe, who created them, a God who loves us and gives us purpose, a God who even came in person to be with us in Jesus Christ, to die for us and rose again to give us new life. That's the Christian story in a nutshell, and that's the way they see the world. That's their worldview. But the atheist, the person who doesn't believe in God, they've also got a worldview, okay? And it's a worldview that they need to defend and justify as well. Because many of the atheists I meet hold to something that's sometimes called naturalism or materialism. And it's the view that there is no God and all that exists is energy and matter and the laws of nature. That's all there is ultimately. And anything else that we think about or see in life well, it's really just an illusion. There is no purpose to life. The universe didn't come from anywhere, and it's not really going anywhere. Um, all those things that we like to invest our lives in, beauty, truth, love, they're all ultimately reducible to atoms in motion. Now, that's an interesting worldview, but you need to defend it. If that's the way you think reality is, then I'm going to ask you a few hard questions about that. So you see, it's not that the Christian has to do all the defending and all the proving things, it's that we've both got a worldview. The atheist over here, there's, they've got one way of seeing the world, and the Christian has another way of seeing the world. And the question is, which one is true? And which one fits the evidence that we actually see? And in my experience, I found that the Christian worldview wins out every time. I think it's the most compelling story we have for what we see around us. And what I want to do this morning is just to explain a few reasons, a few ways that you might begin a conversation with someone who's completely skeptical about faith, someone who just says, look, you've had a great experience, you've had some kind of spiritual feeling when you go to church, whatever. I've never experienced that, so can you show me something that I can, I can look at? And that's where we can say, actually, there is something you can look at. Here's a few reasons why I think Christianity is the best explanation of the way we see the world. We're going to start that with um, a point that says, God makes sense of human existence. Being a human is pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, when you look at ourselves, it, we are extraordinary. And if you look into the data and the medical stuff and the science, it's just extraordinary how complicated and extraordinary our bodies are, the way that we function. And one of the privileges I've had uh, of hosting my show is having all kinds of people from both sides of the argument talk about the science behind biology, behind physics, behind the universe. And one of the most extraordinary things I learned is the way the universe is set up in the most extraordinary way to produce you and me. You see, a lot of atheists out there say, well, science just proves atheism. That's the usual mantra. Science is disproving God and proving atheism. But I think, actually, the trajectory has been in the opposite direction. And this isn't a story that's often being told. But I want to show you a little video. I've tried to condense a big idea into a short video. It's something called the fine-tuning of the universe for life. So I'm going to let the video do the talking for a couple of minutes. Some people say that human existence is a result of a roll of the cosmic dice. Like the gambler who stakes his life savings on the next throw, we just got lucky in the lottery of life. Some people say there's no purpose in the universe, no grand plan, no God behind it all. Our numbers just came up and here we are. But I don't believe them, and nor should you. If I roll this dice, the chances of getting a six is one in six. That's not too bad. But what are the chances of me rolling six twice in a row? Well, the odds get longer. It's one in six times by one in six. That's one in 36. So I'd have to be pretty lucky to get two sixes in a row. 
Now, every time I add the chances of rolling another six in a row, the odds go up exponentially, and it gets even more unlikely. Now, what if I rolled this dice 70 times, and every single time I got a six? OK, that's pretty unlikely, but it's possible, right? Well, in fact, the chances of rolling a six 70 times in a row are around 1 in 10 to the 55. That's a 1 with 55 zeros after it. Now, just to put that in perspective, how long would I have to stand here rolling this dice, allowing about five seconds per roll, before hitting that lucky streak and rolling 76s in a row? Well, I had a mathematician friend work it out for me. On average, you would have to continually roll this dice for 100 trillion 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 years before your numbers come up. That's a long time. What if you applied that thinking to us? What are the odds of us being here? Now, the odds of rolling 76s in a row, 1 in 10 to the 55, as it happens, those are the same odds of something called the expansion rate of the universe being just right for the existence of us here today. From the moment of the Big Bang, when our universe began to rapidly expand, the rate of that expansion was exquisitely finely balanced. Any faster, and the universe would have expanded too rapidly to allow the formation of chemicals, atoms, stars and galaxies. Any slower, and the universe would have collapsed back in on itself. But as it happens, the universe expanded at just the right rate to allow for life to develop in the future, for us to be here. It hit 70 rolls of the number six in a row, first time. And the expansion rate of the universe is just one among 30 or so other incredibly sensitively finely tuned constants and fundamental forces in the universe that must be just the way they are for the universe to be able to produce us. So let's imagine. If I went ahead and rolled this dice 70 times, and what do you know, every time it came up six. No waiting for trillions upon trillions of years, first time. Beginner's luck? Hardly. You would assume that I must have rigged it. Maybe the dice are loaded, maybe there are sixes on every side. It can't be chance. Now let me ask you. Why would we assume that this universe with us in it, which is actually way more improbable than my 70 rolls, is just a result of chance? The fact that we're here shows that someone's loaded the dice. In fact, maybe there's no dice at all. What if the evidence points to this life-permitting universe actually being the product of an intelligent mind which intended for us to be here? Now, you could come up with some speculative other theory. Maybe there's an infinite number of universes, giving you an infinite number of chances to roll the dice. Maybe. But we don't have any scientific evidence for it. So if you're hanging your hat on that possibility, then you're every bit as much committed to a faith position as the person who says God was behind it. Believing in God isn't a delusion. It's a perfectly reasonable conclusion when we look at the fingerprints on our universe. And if it's true that we aren't just the fluke result of a cosmic roll of the dice, and that we're actually here because a grand designer intended us from the very beginning, well, that's worth staking something on. Thank you. I, I, um, that video has become quite popular. It's had over one and a half million views on YouTube. And one person got in touch with me. There'd been someone who'd been struggling with their faith, but this video seemed to put a few things together for them. And they actually sent me a picture of their wrist, and they'd had a dice tattooed on their wrist to remind them that they're not here by chance. Um, it, was, it was amazing. There's been an extraordinary reaction. And for a lot of people, this is the way in. Science isn't something that disproves God. It's something that actually is a way in to seeing how, how crazily special we are in this universe. And it's not just this. I mean, you, I could go on about the, the way that biologically we have this extraordinary DNA within us that seems to speak of some kind of a creative force behind it. I could talk about the, the Big Bang, the fact that somehow time, space, energy and matter all appeared suddenly 14 billion years ago. I mean, who set that off? There are all these ways in which I think what we know about science isn't pointing away from God. It's pointing towards God. So I think when it comes to making sense of human existence, God 
is the best explanation. And I don't think atheism has a great explanation for this because if we're just here by chance, well, we already saw the odds are stacked massively against that. That doesn't make sense as an explanation of why we're here. So I think God is the best explanation of human existence. But now I want to go to my second piece of evidence for you. I think God makes sense of human value. And for this one, we're going to go from looking outside of ourselves at the universe to looking inside of ourselves. And I want to begin this by telling you a story. In 1973, a wealthy businessman, Jaime Jaramillo, was walking along the streets of Bogota in Colombia when he saw a young girl climbing through a manhole down into the sewers below. Well, Jaime was intrigued. He went home, he put on a wetsuit, and he followed that young girl into the sewers. And to his amazement, he discovered about 90 children living in these filthy, rat-infested sewers under the streets of Bogota. The reason they were there was that on the streets above, off-duty policemen were killing these children. They were shooting them. Uh, one officer said this, he said, killing these kids is like killing lice. We call them the disposables. Now, since then, Jaime has gone on to rescue hundreds of these street kids, and he's put them in a loving Christian home. He's used his money to give them an education and a life there. And I'm sure, like me, you find that story both incredibly disturbing and inspiring. Disturbing that people could treat kids like that. Inspiring because of what Jaime did. We react with horror at the idea that people could be treated as disposables. But then I think we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Why do we believe that human life should be valued? Why did Jaime do the right thing? Now, the fact is, on atheism, I've struggled to find an answer to this question of why we value human life this way. Because if all that's going on in reality is matter in motion and a random force of evolution producing all the different life we have on Earth, then we're just one more randomly produced piece of life on Earth. There's nothing particularly special about us. Why should we uh, intrinsically think that we're more valuable than the louse? If one culture develops a disregard for life, for human life, then that's just the way that culture is developed. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just the way the world is. There's nothing intrinsically special about us for any particular reason on an atheistic view of life. But we don't feel that way, do we? That doesn't feel right. In our bones, we feel, no, that's, that's not the right story. I had a really interesting conversation with the person I mentioned earlier, Richard Dawkins. Uh, he was having a debate at Oxford University with John Lennox, who will be joining me at Unbelievable Live in LA. And they had a fascinating conversation, uh, the Christian and the atheist debating God, science, and faith. And at the after-show party, I managed to get hold of my very first interview with Richard Dawkins, probably the most famous atheist on the planet. And I managed to get my 10 minutes with him, and we had a conversation about human value. And I want to just read you exactly how part of our conversation went. I said to him, but if we'd evolved into a society where rape was considered fine, would that mean that rape is fine? And he said, I don't want to answer that question. It's enough for me to say that we live in a society where it's not considered fine. We live in a society where selfishness, failure to pay your debts, failure to reciprocate favors is regarded askance. That's a value judgment, but I'm glad that I live in such a society. And I responded, but when you make a value judgment, don't you yourself immediately step outside of this evolutionary process and say that the reason this is good is that it's good, and, and you don't really have any way to stand on that statement? And he replied, well, my value judgment itself could come from my evolutionary past. And I said, well, well, therefore, it's just as random, in a sense, as any product of evolution. And he said, you could say that, but in any case, nothing about it makes it more probable that there's, there's anything supernatural. And I finished by saying, OK, but ultimately, your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact we've developed five fingers rather than six. And he said, you could say that, yes. And you could say that. And actually, I think if you're a thoroughgoing atheist, you should say that. But why do we feel that's so wrong? Why do we know that, that there's a reason we shouldn't treat people that way? Why do we feel somehow in our bones, recoil at the idea that our moral belief that rape is wrong 
Is that just the happenstance of the hand that evolution happens to have dealt, dealt us? No, we know that it's not the story. We know there's something about being human that means that you have to treat someone a certain way, don't we? What explains that feeling? What explains that idea that we have this inherent dignity and value? Where does that come from? Again, Christianity has a ready answer. You have inherent dignity and value because you are made in the image of God. And that gives you inestimable value. In fact, God values you so much he came in person to die for you. I mean, you cannot get a statement of greater value of what a human life is worth than that. So it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire living in a penthouse or you're a street kid in the streets of Bogota. You have value. And nothing else can change that. That's the Christian story. That's why I believe we have this sense that we have human value. It's because we're made in the image of God. And I don't believe that atheists have an adequate answer for that. It's very hard to justify, if you're an atheist, why we believe in this idea of human dignity and human value. God makes sense of human value. Third piece of evidence that I'm going to bring this morning. I believe that God makes sense of human purpose. I want to introduce you to a lady called Jennifer Fulweiler. She grew up in a loving family, but one in which religion was painted as clearly false. Jennifer says that she never remembers a time in her life growing up when she believed in God. She was raised on a diet of science, reason, and evidence-based thinking. Her bedtime reading was Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos, believe it or not. And from a young age, she said she just assumed that the world ran according to a well-established set of natural laws, atoms, electrons, no need for God to explain anything in life. And she remained a happy atheist into the early years of her marriage. However, shortly after the birth of her first child, Jennifer had a very big, dramatic shift in her thinking. She describes it this way in her own words. She says, I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a purely atheist, materialist perspective, he's a randomly evolved collection of chemical reactions. And I realized, well, if that's true, then all the love that I feel for him is nothing more than chemical reactions in my brain. And I looked down at him, and I thought, that's not true. That's not the truth. And that moment was a turning point for Jennifer, and it led her on a journey that ultimately ended in Jesus Christ. And I think what Jennifer realized at that moment is that atheism tells a very different story about purpose and meaning to the one that Christianity tells. Again, Richard Dawkins, who I've referenced a few times this morning, has summarized it very neatly. He, he wrote this, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And he's absolutely right. If there's no God, that is the universe we should expect to see. You know, if there's no God, if atheism is true, then all of our human endeavors, all of our self-made human purposes, they're one day going to be gone and forgotten in a, in a trillion or so years, when all that's left is, you know, a, a vast cosmic expanse of nothing, because that's the story, actually, if the universe just peters out, that's what will happen to everything. There's no purpose, there's no meaning. But I see a very different universe to Richard Dawkins. I don't know about you, but when I look around, I don't just see physical processes and natural laws. I see love. I see truth. I see beauty. I see hope. I see good and I see evil. I see a universe that is teeming with purpose and meaning. And I don't think atheism can account for that. You see, we all experience this deep down longing for something more, don't we? sometimes called the argument from transcendence. There's a great quote by C.S. Lewis, who's one of my favorite Christian thinkers, and he says this, a baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. People feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. 
Could that desire that spans all times, places, and cultures, that desire for something more, for meaning, for purpose, could it be that it has a real object which satisfies it? I love the fact that when we sang that song a hundred billion times, it talked about the glory of the universe and this God who created a hundred billion stars and galaxies and they're all singing his praise and we're just joining in the praise of the whole universe. That's a story that's worth living for. That's a story I want to be part of. That's a story with purpose and meaning and hope in it. And the reason it is, is because at the center of it, there's a person called Jesus Christ. You see, one thing we know about the human condition is there are two things we can't live without. Love and hope. If you starve someone of love, if you take away hope, that person doesn't have a reason to live anymore. And when Jesus Christ came, he gave us those with both hands outstretched because on the cross, he showed the most supreme sacrificial act of love we could ever hope to witness. And when he rose again from death, he gave us the most significant sense of hope we could possibly hope for. Hope for another world. Hope not just that the grave is the end, but that there's a real meaning to our life. That whether you were born on the streets of Bogota or whether you're living in the penthouse, your life means something. There is purpose. That sense inside you that there's something about you that matters. It's been, there's a great big yes on that in Jesus' resurrection. You see, I meet many atheists and I love them. When I have atheists on my show, I, I get on so well with them. They're good people. The average atheist is not some kind of hard-bitten, angry, you know, anti-God person. Actually, they're people kind of like you and me. And when I criticize the atheist worldview, I'm not dismissing their honest search for truth. And I wouldn't want you to go away from here thinking that we should somehow you know, just get into an argument with an atheist and show them that they're wrong. They're on a journey for truth as well. We're all on that journey. But we do have some significant differences in how we view our story. You see, I find it very hard to believe that the rational and ordered universe we live in came from nowhere and is heading nowhere. I find it impossible to conceive that our intrinsic beliefs about human value and dignity are in the end just an illusion. And I can't convince myself that this search for purpose and meaning that we witness in all times and places is ultimately in vain. To me, it makes far more sense to read God's fingerprints and purposes both out there in the universe we find ourselves in and within here in our deepest longings and purposes. That's why I'm a Christian. At the 10-year ten, ten mark of doing my show, having listened to all of these arguments and objections to faith from atheists, I did a special show where I said, ask me anything to the audience. And the most common question that came in from both Christians and non-Christians listening was this. They said, Justin, how come after hearing all those objections to faith, how come you're still a Christian? And to answer that question, I actually wrote a book. It's called Unbelievable. Why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. And I present some of these ideas and show that actually when it comes to deciding between atheism and Christianity, I think we've got an amazing story, an amazing way of looking at the world. It's something we can be thankful for, that faith is not something that's simply blind, where you're delusional if you believe in God, no. It's based on evidence. It's based on the way we see the universe out there and the way we experience life in here. And I hope that when you go and have that conversation, the one that you're probably dreading, with that friend or neighbor or family member who doesn't believe, that you'll go out with a little bit more confidence to start a conversation and to listen and to respond and to say, well, here's something that might help you see things a different way. It's been so good sharing the morning with you. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you. I'd, I'd just love to, to pray for you guys. So. Um, and I don't know, I know that very often in a place like this and perhaps watching, not everyone comes here with the same beliefs. Not everyone is at the same place in the journey. And maybe there's people here who, who haven't made up their mind about God. So I'm just going to pray that whoever you are and wherever you are on that journey, you would know that God is here. And God hasn't left us without evidence of his, his existence, but he's actually come in person 
to reveal himself to us. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.